as you are all aware, we uh, discuss in this series uh, the short stories that were written in the 19th century, uh, particularly uh, in England, but also in Europe. And uh, we have today uh, uh, Professor Payal Nagpal, who teaches English in uh, Nanki Devi Memorial College, uh, to speak on uh, an author uh, whom I consider always as, a, as a novelist and almost ne never as a short story writer. And uh, the writer is, uh, is, is the French author, the famous French author, Emil Zola, uh, writing in the 19th century. And uh, uh, well, uh, I, I'll start with a question from Professor Pal Nagpal uh, regarding Zola, because Zola is generally considered in the critical debates as a uh, naturalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a difference, uh, so far as we are concerned, who believe in humanism and rational thought. We believe that uh, rational, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, Naturalism and uh, realism are somewhat different. Uh, I, I would uh, generally discuss uh, Zola as a person who uh, is always using the fact, always using the detail, always telling us about where he stands, what he says, etc., and that is scientifically, scientifically proven. Uh, is that naturalism? Is that realism? And what exactly is realism for you? I would, if you would, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Prakash. So, uh, yes, this is a very important uh, question that you have raised. Uh, Zola is considered to be the father of uh, naturalism and uh, uh, one of the questions that is often asked and uh, there are two very different views to it. One is that, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, realism and naturalism are the same and a lot of people use the two terms interchangeably. Uh, I generally like to make a very uh, a fine difference between realism and naturalism, which is that uh, with realism, we tend to have a fuller picture of the society. It's like we can see the different uh, layers, social layers that are there in the society and how they interact with each other, how they behave with each other. Mm -hmm. With naturalism, in a sense, the focus is... Uh, in one way different because uh, it's uh, you know more objective than anything else but also the focus narrows a bit so the kind of fuller expression of society that we see in realism uh, is something that uh, uh, narrows a bit in naturalism and here I think uh, a classic example to prove it would then be uh, looking at the short stories by writers like Balzac on the one hand and short stories by uh, a writer like uh, Zola. So, in your opinion, Balzac is a realist and Zola is a naturalist. Yes, yes, that's okay. the, that's mm -hmm. what I would generally like to say. And also, uh, naturalism, in a sense, it's it's interesting because uh, 18th century is known for rationality and a kind of objective perspective, and that I think is taken and uh, uh, kind of. Uh, looked at the developments, I mean, 18th century onwards, pretty much in the 19th century, uh, with uh, Charles Darwin's uh, origin of species and so on. Uh, the focus is on science and nature, and nature in the uh, uh, scientific sense of it, and oh, uh, not means, really in the Kantian uh, sense Which means that it. science com combined with the nature, uh, they become naturalism, and uh, realism is when it is fuller, in the, uh, to use your words, and uh, where life as such, as, as it presents itself before us, and uh, as it means something specific, that is realism. Would, would, would that be correct? I, I would agree with this. And uh, in a sense, uh, uh, Zola, of course, takes on from, uh, you know, a lot of scientific uh, approaches and the scientific perspective that is there. And uh, the two, uh, you know, cornerstones in a sense of naturalism are considered to be heredity and environment. So a person behaves in a certain way because, uh, you know, either it, uh, heredity is held uh, responsible for it or the environment has had a certain impact, uh, you know, on, on the <coughs> characters. Uh, Dr. So, Nagpal, you have not mentioned society at all. <laughs> you have talked so, only about nature, about heredity. Uh, about, about rationality, about science, but not about society. So that is because uh, perhaps we are talking about naturalism. Yes, this is because I am talking about naturalism and naturalism takes all these into account to understand society. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how are we looking at society? How are we looking at 
the the characters that belong to a certain period so you know nature a scientific perspective objectivity rationality heredity environment these are the factors that allow us to actually uh, look at society from what we can call a naturalistic uh, perspective so I, I thank you for the clarity that you have given us to regarding these two terms and now you can present the lecture yes thank you so uh, this is a portrait of uh, zola from about 1865 uh, Zola was uh, born in 1840 and uh, lived pretty much up to uh, 1902 and uh, he started, uh, he's very famously known as uh, a novelist and uh, 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 as Professor pra Prakash rightly pointed out that we know Zola more for his novels, uh, what is famously known as the Rogan uh, Macha series, uh, which is France under, you know, the, the rule of Napoleon III or uh, broadly what is considered to be uh, the second uh, French Empire, the period from 1851 to about 1871. So uh, a lot of these uh, novels were written, uh, you know, during the establishment of the Third Republic, uh, not the Empire, but the Third Republic. And uh, it is 1870 in that sense is a important moment, you know, with the uh, war between France and Prussia that finally led to the establishment of what is called the Third Republic and, uh, you know, the collapse of the Second French Empire. And uh, it is uh, important to mention this because the story that we are going to discuss today, The Miller's Daughter, is a, it also takes into account a moment of, uh, you know, the Franco-Prussian War. So, um, Zola was, uh, it's very interesting as a writer, he was very clued in and uh, uh, he was very close to writers like Flaubert and uh, uh, the Russian writer uh, Ivan Turgenev. So uh, uh, he was friends with the Impressionist uh, painters, especially uh, Paul Cezanne. So uh, Zola's uh, exposure to the world of literature, arts and aesthetics was very, very full and uh, complete in that sense. Uh, so to take on uh, from the point uh, that uh, Professor Prakash has raised and the point being about uh, naturalism itself. So uh, uh, this is to uh, actually uh, quote from the introduction to what is called uh, the, the Rogan uh, Makhat series. And um, it's, it's interesting that he starts the series of about 20 novels. And uh, this is very similar to the series that was started by Balzac in his time, which was called The Human Comedy, where he wrote a series of novels. So Zola's project uh, is very akin to uh, what Balzac has done uh, during his time. So, uh, you know, in the introduction, the preface actually, he writes, I want to explain how a family, a small group of regular people behaves in society. While expanding through the birth of 10, 20 individuals, who seem at first glance profoundly dissimilar, but who are shown through analysis to be intimately linked to one another. You know, this is where uh, the reason why uh, we are reading this particular quotation is to understand where Zola is coming from and to understand what the naturalistic approach is all about. So, uh, he says that heredity has its own laws like gravity and he says, I will attempt to find and follow by resolving the double question of temperaments and environments the thread that leads mathematically from one man to another. If you look at this particular quotation that forms uh, you know, part of the preface to the series that he writes, then we are talking about family, a group of people, society, how these people appear to be dissimilar, but they are linked to each other through the factor of heredity. Then, uh, you know, temperament, environment, how environment compels the individual in a sense to behave in a different manner. And uh, here is a, a quotation from what is famously known as the experimental novel. And so uh, Zola says, and I quote, uh, and this is what constitutes the experimental novel, to possess a knowledge of the mechanism of the phenomena inherent in man to show the machinery of his intellectual and sensory manifestations under the influences of heredity, 
and environment. So, which means that when we look at the naturalistic approach, be it his short fiction, be it the novel, we are looking, we are analyzing human nature, uh, intellect, uh, you know, the intellectual aspects, as well as what he calls the sensory manifestations through what we can say is, uh, you know, a certain kind of machinery. So, and this is regulated by heredity and environment. Such as physiology, he says, shall give them to us. And then finally, to exhibit man, to understand characters through this approach and to showcase, to present man living in social conditions produced by himself, which he modifies daily and in the heart of which he himself experiences a continual transformation. So, this in a sense explains the approach that Zola has towards the process of writing and towards the characters that are there. To extend this argument further, Zola also says, you know, he raises the question of who then is the experimental novelist? So, you know, who is this writer who can call himself or herself the experimental novelist? So, he says this, it is one who accepts proven facts and points out in man and in society the mechanism. So, the word mechanism and again the word science keeps coming and they, which means that when we analyze human beings, we have to analyze them in terms of a certain mechanism. And this approach is a scientific approach. Uh, Zola is often critiqued that at times his approach becomes too deterministic and heredity and environment are considered to be too deterministic. So, uh, uh, I, I think uh, one needs to uh, look at the writer and his approach in terms of the times, uh, I think, to which he belongs, where the times, you know, possibly demanded a certain change and the change came in the form of uh, naturalism. So, you know, another aspect that he stresses on, what he calls personal sentiment is, it is established by observation and experiment. So, here I'd like to uh, request Professor Prakash and ask him what he thinks. No, actually, uh, we have used the essential <coughs> words and they are all, uh, they, are, they all come from science. For instance, uh, physiology. Physiology means the body. The, the, the way, you know, a human body functions uh, in its natural manner. So, that is the element of nature, physiology, and uh, heredity is, is the right word for that, that the, the person is born uh, with the genes of uh, the, the, the parents and, and, and the grandparents, and that that is the selfhood of man so far as he is concerned. And since they are uh, scientifically investigatable, therefore, uh, Zola would call himself also a kind of so, so scientist. scientist. And uh, when he comes to society, then that society is the social relations, and there is a kind of interaction between this physiological man, this natural man, and the society. And, and, and the whole term, and you are using all those words very, very carefully, uh, this is what should be done, that he is uh, totally keeping out the, the, the ethics, the, the actual practice, the, the, the anger, and all, all other things. He, of course, he uses the word sensory, but in the sensory, uh, anger is there and not there. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is generally there is uh, the, the, the smell, the, the, the uh, sound, the touch, all those things. But, 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 but where is discussion? Where, where is the interaction? That is not, that, that seems to be underplayed as, as you rightly say. The, the focus is on uh, the aspects of human being uh, which are physiological in nature and which are rooted in the past. So I would say that uh, there is a lot of truth in this, but then th there is something, that, as, as you point out rightly, there is something that is lacking in it because the word uh, mechanism, uh, mechanics, that betrays it. Yes. So, so I would say that this is a good problematization of the problem. Absolutely. I think uh, this is how we need to uh, look at the difference between realism and uh, naturalism. So, uh, to begin with the story, if I were to just give the summary in a nutshell. So, the Miller's Daughter, <coughs> the title is uh, The Miller's Daughter. At times, it's also translated. I came across certain other translations which translated the story as the attack on the mill. Now, the story is about a miller, his daughter, 
and how she falls in love with this uh, man, uh, you know, who's actually uh, uh, not uh, a Frenchman. He's basically a Belgian. And everybody is very upset about, uh, uh, you know, this match because they think that this man is good for nothing. And uh, uh, however, the man, of course, proves himself. And uh, uh, meanwhile, what happens is that the mill is attacked. And uh, how, uh, you know, they both, uh, that is the, the daughter and uh, uh, the, the, the Belgian man, they both stand up for each other and, you know, try to uh, fight for each other. And uh, there's a happy resolution. And, you know, when the Prussians attack, finally, towards the end of the story, it's the French, uh, you know, who are uh, back. And even though uh, the Belgian man, Dominic, he gets shot, uh, finally, there's a happy resolution at the end of the story. So this is the story in a nutshell. But this story, uh, interestingly, is also about the mill itself. And if uh, there are these, uh, you know, if I were to say that, you know, how many characters are there, primary characters, then I would say that it is the miller, the miller's daughter, Dominic. But there's another character here. The fourth character is probably the most important, and that is the mill itself. So uh, if we actually look at it, the story begins with a reference to the mill. So how Pair uh, Merlier's mill, one beautiful summer evening, was arranged for a grand fete. In the courtyard were three tables placed end to end which awaited the guests. Everyone knew that Frasua, Merlier's daughter, was that night to be betrothed to Dominic, a young man who was accused of idleness but whom the fair sex for three leaves, uh, leagues around gazed at with sparkling eyes. Such a fine appearance had he. So here is this man who is extremely good looking, but he is considered to be idle. He is considered to be idle because he is busy uh, fishing and uh, uh, he just grows uh, some vegetables which are enough for his subsistence. And across the river, uh, you know, the two only, they have never met, they have never spoken to each other. And, uh, you know, they just look at each other and they fall in love. So, uh, everybody is, and, uh, you know, Pair Merlier, who's been the mayor of the place, uh, <clears throat> everybody is very upset about this particular match and they think that it's not going to be good for, uh, uh, you know, uh, Frasua. So, um, Dominic is, uh, you know, he has a certain identity. But it is, it is the mill here that is, you know, in all of this first chapter that we have, it is the mill that has been described in great detail. So, for instance, a little later, Pair Merlier's mill and live in with its tic-tac. You know, it's almost as if the sound that the mill makes, the wheel that the mill has, uh, everything comes to life. And uh, when the Prussians attack, it seems uh, that it is the mill that is kind of holding, uh, holding up. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, ask... Uh, Professor Prakash here, what he thinks about this importance that is given to the mill, uh, you know, in a story, I think, written in the 1870s. Uh, I wonder if, you know, I mean, we have George Eliot's mill on the floor uh, that belongs uh, yes, to the I, same I, I, time. I, yes, I was thinking of that and uh, uh, the mill on the floor, you know, had that miller <coughs> and there also there is a miller and it's a, it's a place of work and it is work, you know, that, that, that compels human beings to get together, to come together. And in this particular story that we talk about, and the, the mill is the place where the two people meet and, and where they will marry and, and, and whatever happens, you know, uh, later with their life. All those things will be considered from the point of view of the surroundings of the mill and the mill itself. So, in fact, mill is a kind of character. I think uh, this is very interesting for the, for the story uh, to have a place as the symbol of togetherness of man and woman. So, that, that's how I would like to consider and, and the mill also, I think, standing up, uh, really speaking for humanity, and in this case also, I guess, you know, the, the French honor and victory, mm -hmm. uh, so to say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if we uh, just look at this, it dipped partially in the morel, which rounded at that point into a basin, and, and the way in which, you know, even the water that falls from the wheel has been described uh, very vividly here. So, how water fell from a height of several meters and... Uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting statement uh, that uh, several meters on the mill wheel, which cracked as it turned with the asthmatic cuff of a faithful servant grown old in the house. So, you know, even the age of uh, the wheel that is there in the mill, 
I think that itself has been described very, very vividly. And every time, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, mayor, that is, uh, Per uh, Merlier, is advised to change it, he decides not to. And, uh, you know, he knows what is going to uh, uh, work and he mends uh, the wheel. So, and the wheel appeared gayer than ever for it. So, it, this kind of description of the wheel of the mill, it goes on paragraph after paragraph, almost as if, you know, this is, uh, this is a character that is, you know, probably, I would say that it is the most important character, which is why I think certain translators decided to call this not the miller's daughter, but the attack on the mill. So, uh, <coughs> certain other characters that, uh, you know, are brought into the story, there's a reference to Per Merlier's wife. You know, he had been mayor of uh, Porus. He was ex esteemed for, you know, the fortune he had acquired. It, it, the mill actually uh, came uh, with his wife in dowry and at that point of time, he did not have much, but he managed to work very hard and establish himself. But the mill had, you know, come to him uh, through uh, his wife. So, uh, he possessed only, uh, you know, as I said in the story, he possessed only his two arms, which is why initially, though he himself is very reluctant about this match between Dominic and Frasua, uh, he ultimately, uh, you know, thinks about his own life and uh, how, uh, you know, he did not have anything, but, you know, it turned out to be quite a successful marriage. And, uh, as uh, uh, does this particular relationship between Dominic and uh, uh, his daughter. So, um, his, uh, certainly he uh, might have rested, allowed the mill wheel to slumber, but it would have been too dull for him. So, uh, when we look at the description of Dominic, again, very interesting, he is described as a foreigner many times in the story. He's come to, he inherits this estate that he comes to, and uh, from his uncle and he decides uh, he comes to uh, Rorus to actually sell this property and return home but he was totally charmed by the district and he decides that he's going to stay on here and he basically uh, lives on uh, vegetables uh, that he had grown and fish uh, you know he, he fishes he hunts and so he's also referred to as a poacher many times and uh, at any rate he was he was also considered to be lazy and often found asleep on the grass when he should have been at work. Now, this is, broadly speaking, the, the map of the different characters that the story presents to us. Uh, friends, uh, <coughs> uh, Professor Pahal Nagpal has uh, given the framework of the story and the descriptions, and the descriptions are as much of the people uh, involved in the action, whatever action there is, uh, as, as well as the place uh, that is called the mill. So I think this is a, a good uh, background to work on and uh, to raise the uh, you know, point of uh, intellect, the point of understanding that Zola has to share with his Thank you.